Hello, everybody, and welcome to the live stream. So if you aren't aware, there is a uh, pro-Bitcoin advocate who just won the presidential election for Argentina, uh, Javier Millet. And it looks like things are going pretty good over there, hopefully for Bitcoiners and everywhere and worldwide. But the question is, is this good for Bitcoin? And of course, how pro-Bitcoin is he and what's next? So uh, if you uh, weren't aware, uh, this is the gentleman right here, Argentina presidential election, far right. I always like that, far right, you know, whatever they, they, they mean by that. Libertarian Javier Millet wins after rival concedes. And the funny thing was, is he was running against the, the uh, uh, finance minister, which I found uh, hilarious because of the amount of uh, inflation that was going on. And that was the person he was running against. And of course, in the very beginning, it looked like he was going to lose. And I thought to myself, if he loses against the guy who just put inflation all the way up over 120%, there's no hope for any of us. So this actually came out last night around 7 p.m. Uh, here in uh, Atlantic Center time. So this looks uh, very positive. And the reason it's positive, it's not just because we got one more uh, pro-Bitcoin advocate in a presidential spot, but the question then becomes, well, how big is it? You know, how big is it? Well, first of all, uh, this is El Salvador. Uh, of course, this was the first the, the first country to uh, uh, have a a president who says who came over uh, Bukele and said, "Look, we're going to use Bitcoin. It's going to be legal tender. We're going to push this throughout the entire region." They their GDP was roughly twenty eight. Well, we'll say twenty nine billion as of twenty twenty one. Not bad, you know. Nothing to sneeze at. I mean, I'll take it. But uh, if we take a look at Argentina, that's four hundred eighty seven billion dollars. GDP. Now, as far as like the population, you look at 45.8 million or so, and then El Salvador, 6 million. So again, this is just one more step up. This is great. I'm not going to take anything away from it. This is good news for us moving forward. But here's the big question. Why did this happen? Well, first of all, it happened because inflation got way, way, way out of control. Looks like it was as of September 14th, 124%. And things were going to spiral out of just spiral out of control, obviously. 124% as cost of living crisis sharpens. And you can see this from 2017, monthly inflation, right? And it's been uh, quite big. And people have been talking about that they might have to move out. They might have to close their stores because you can go to one shop and buy an apple for however many uh, Argentine pesos it actually is. You go to another shop, it's like double the price. So people are like, we can't keep doing this. This is ridiculous. We need to get this under control. And that is essentially what... Javier ran on and won. However, he's not going to implement Bitcoin on day one. He has been very vocal about how pro-Bitcoin he is. But you understand, like I said, uh, you, it's not going to happen from day one. They need to get things under control first. They need to put out the fire. And the way they want to do this is adopting the U.S. dollar. Yes, right. The U.S. dollar. I know some people right now is like, why don't they just do Bitcoin from the very beginning? Why don't you do this Bitcoin from the very beginning? It's because it's volatile. That's why it's super volatile. I don't believe that right now you should have the legal tender for an entire country in Bitcoin. Correct me in the comment section. I, 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 just, I just don't see that actually happening. In El Salvador, when they got into it in 2021, imagine if they just took away the US dollar and said, okay, it's only Bitcoin right now. And of course, Bitcoin went from 65, 67,000, wherever they actually implemented it, that would be the all time high. And it dropped over 77%. So if you're taking a look at it that way, I'm not sure that's the right way to go in the short term. Long term, hey, anything's up in the air and that's what it is. So, of course, when people are hearing about this, they're like, oh, this guy's a stooge. He's just a uh, fiat monster and he just wants to bring the U.S. dollar and that's pretty much it. And I was like, look, it's the same thing over in El Salvador. They're, they have two official currencies, the U.S. dollar and Bitcoin. And they are using Lightning Network. So good for them. So I said, essentially, I think you live in a fantasy world. If you think that they're going to go from day one to use Bitcoin, it's good news, but it takes time. And I think that's one of the things that we we miss out in, in the market itself. We think that, OK, we got a guy in there. Now it's Bitcoin all the way. And then here we go. I think not everybody. I mean, for the most of us, we're pretty much reasonable, rational people. We know Bitcoin's the right way. We know that moving forward, it's a good way to go as far as you know, being a store of value, being gold 2.0, being a hedge against inflation, uh, you know, as far as like long-term store of value. And we can talk about that later, later, but this is what we have. And this, these are the things that it is. And I always said, I'm like, look, 
if you think that Bitcoin is was the original purpose for peer-to-peer -peer transactions, we talked about this yesterday. Did you know that the Bitcoin average transactions as of yesterday, it was 18 bucks. Ethereum average transaction fee was almost five. Now it's dropped considerably today, down to ten dollars. But did you know that even today, the Bitcoin average transaction fee is double Ethereum gas fees? Insanity, insanity. So that will lead us to our last point, which is this. Some people will say, "Look, this doesn't make any sense because you know Javier he he ran on that. Is he really?" a pro Bitcoin advocate. So this was an interview. It's about uh, two minutes long. It's in Spanish. So I'm going to interpret. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to read the actual uh, comments down here or the uh, subtitles because I know that half of you watch the show and probably the other half or maybe more just listen to the show. So I will tell you what he's saying and who is actually saying it. So uh, Javier right here is uh, sitting in front of a newscaster and newscaster asks him the question. And uh, let me just uh, go from here. So people talk about Bitcoin and media all the time. This is the newscaster. Uh, we don't know how Bitcoin works, but there are people that say that there could be a monetary alternative. Do you believe that's possible in Argentina? And then Javi says, yeah, let's see. What's the point? The point is that the first thing we have to understand is that the central bank is a scam. Oh, beautiful. It's a mechanism by which politicians cheat to the good people with the inflationary tax. What Bitcoin is representing is... The return of money to its original creator, which would be us, the private sector. Money is a private invention in order to be used to solve problems. For example, in a bartering economy, the double coincidence of wants and indivisibility. Then paper money appears to solve portability, which is true. Actually, he had different currencies, linen, wheat, salt, where it come from. The word salt from salary or salary from the word salt. Hence comes a superstition that when salt falls off the table, you got to throw it over your shoulder. And then that was evolving in the currencies that the people chosen, that the people chose were the silver for small transactions and the gold for the bigger ones. Then, because back then it was very dangerous to move the gold, people used to deposit the gold and get an exchange, a receipt. This is all true. Thousands of years ago. This is why there's still gold bugs out there. And then in the year 1445, in the first Genovese Congress, the states appropriated the exclusivity to issue the money, the paper money, the fiat. That's the legal tender, which is a key point because the legal tender allows the politicians to scam you with the inflationary tax. This is exactly right. Bitcoin has an algorithm that one day will reach a certain amount and there is no more, 21 million, and it can compete with other currencies. In fact, it competes with Ethereum and others. I don't know about that. And what's the good thing? It's the return of the private money to the private citizens. But what about the economy, the country? The problem is that the governments will not give up the legal tender. Stop it. The problem is that the governments will not give up the legal tender. I got to agree with him here. Do you kind of understand where I'm coming from as far as like with Gary Gensler approving spot Bitcoin ETFs? He knows it competes with the dollar. The White House knows it competes with the dollar. The Biden administration knows it competes with the dollar. Why doesn't he do it? Why doesn't he just go move it forward? He does all the futures. Futures were great especially when you were shorting it in the CBOE in 2017. So again, this is correct. And he's speaking truth to power. What, but, 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 because legal tender, they can scam you with the inflationary tax. Also true. Bitcoin is the natural reaction against the central bankers. Scammers are going to make the money private again. Bitcoin, natural reaction against the central bankers. And the flip side is that the thieving politicians are not going to allow you to go against the legal tender, unfortunately. In economies with high inflation, the scam problem is bigger, Argentina. That's why, as I suggest, you can propose to close the central banks, which is what he's going to do, what he wants to do. Let's see if he gets it done. And then that's pretty much it. And he goes on to a rant. So again, talking about that, this is what Milton Friedman talked about in the 1970s. Nobel Prize winner for... Uh, uh, economics. And he, and he said, look, inflation's made in one place than one place only. That's the U.S. government. But that's the government itself. And he, of course, he's American, so he talks to the U.S. government. He said, this is where primarily it comes from. There's a little bit that can come from actual supply and demand. You understand that. But it all starts with one place and one place only. The Treasury, the U.S. Department, 
And that's where inflationary comes from. And it's control. That's really what it is. I'm not going to preach on this, but I'm saying, yes, it's good that Javi won. Javier won the presidential election there in Argentina. But for him to go from zero to a thousand and put everything in Bitcoin right now, I think it's going to take a little bit of time. But that's how it always is. That's how it always goes. It's all about time. It's all about moving forward. And speaking of time, this is what it really comes down to. It's all about technology. And this is the thing that I'm, I'm trying to get in everybody's head before the next bull run comes. It's that I fell victim to this too. In 2017, when I understood about Bitcoin, I'm like, why does everybody just use that? It makes a lot of sense. Let's just use that and move forward. I mean, not everybody has to use it, but I mean, I, I think the, the majority of the world can understand how this works. And that doesn't, it's not, it doesn't go like that. Things move slow, especially with technology, especially new stuff, we would say. So like I always compare it to this, like iron was found, was created to, or discovered by man, early man of 5,000 BC. We can make simple things. You can make daggers and hatchets and jewelry and a little bit of uh, shielding and stuff like that. Fantastic. And then we, then we figured out steel in 1800 BC, which is an alloy of iron and carbon. And we made great things. We made skyscrapers, transportation, railroads, and just recently, uh, for SpaceX, stainless steel was one of the compounds that they used in the spaceships. Fantastic. Not just alloys, stainless steel. Fantastic. And now we go to Bitcoin. It's only was around since 2009. And we're trying to figure out what the technology actually really does, what is the best fit, where can it go from here? So is it is it peer-to-peer -peer transactions like it says in the uh, white paper? Is it gold 2.0? Is it an inflation hedge? Is it a store of value, long-term or short-term? We're trying to figure all those things out. And you can make a case for every single one of these moving down the line. But again, I think things take time. I don't think that we're going to see mass, mass adoption for this next bull run, even though we have the Fidelities and we have the Black Rocks and everything else. It's their job to convince average Joe public that Bitcoin's a good thing. The problem is, is that people don't really understand about where inflation comes from, how money moves, what's going on in the government, because they're too busy, distracted by other things. And I'll let you comment in the uh, comment section below about that. So let me know what you think there. And then uh, lastly, I just want to show a couple of things. Not lastly, I should say it's a couple of things. We talked about this yesterday about accumulation. Because when we talk about Bitcoin, I, I know it gets in the people's head that Bitcoin's the, the one main thing. And if you take a look here, let me minimize this. As far as like accumulation, how it all works, this is the, to me, it was a time to accumulate in 2022. Things were going down, probably not the best time. Probably the best absolute time was November 2022 <laughs> when everything was hitting its all time low. But now that we're in November 2023, I wanted to take a look and just go back in time. There's a website called coinmarketcap.com forward slash historical. If you go to coinmarketcap, you can just click on historical tab and it'll take you here. And you can look at the snapshots of all the different cryptos going back to 2013 in the top. Well, in this one, it's the top 10. And it's amazing to me how many last. And it's very few, really. I mean, Bitcoin and Litecoin, sure. Namecoin, oh, you weren't even trying for that one. Peercoin, Feathercoin, Freecoin, Terra. None of this stuff exists anymore. I mean, come on. What I want to see, though, is if we go back. So let's, I'm a big believer in the four-year cycles. So. Four years ago, we're looking at November, I don't know, 17th, 2019. Yeah. 2019, November 17th. Let me see something. Did I do this one? Oh, yeah. All right. So it's actually 2019. Look at this. November 2019. Let's say the 17th. Look at these prices back then. I mean, unbelievable. 8,500. Ethereum was $185. XRP was 26 cents, which is not much anymore. It's not much higher than that, thanks to thanks to uh, the SEC. Bitcoin Cash 268. Litecoin 59 bucks. EOS three dollars. Binance coin, BNB coin, $20, Bitcoin SV. So I just wanted to say that there's, there's things being made here in the altcoin market. The question is, is which one is it going to make it? Because some of these are not in the top 10 anymore. And moving down, you can see what I'm talking about. But 
The question is, which ones are going to be? And this one comes down to the alts. And the alts, one of the ones I like is near. And I don't know if you were paying attention, but near went up almost in like 24 hours, went up 19%. And it just seems like like different altcoins pop off at certain times. And some people have been, been messaging me and going, hey, why isn't my token popping off? Because everything else is. Just give it time. And I was thinking to myself, I'm like, first of all, I'm like, why is it doing so well? Because I personally think Near Protocol is doing really well. It's already got sharding going on with its nightshade. It's supposed to be an upgrade to make it over a million transactions per second. Um, and of course, it was responsible for the Sweatcoin TGE where it had millions of millions of, of people switching over uh, Web 2 to Web 3 and it didn't even buckle, didn't shut down, no problems. And it, and it just went and did it. But now I think... Price is catching up. Does it mean it's not going to drop tomorrow? It go to a dollar tomorrow. I don't know. It's volatile. But there's a couple of reasons, I think. One of those, and we talked about this uh, a couple of days ago, this is uh, Sandeep from Polygon. And he talks about how Polygon Labs and Near Foundation are going to build a, build a ZK WASM, which will allow chains to prove on Ethereum and have Ethereum layer two security. So again, you see these big titans kind of uh, working together in the top 30 or so. You got Polygon and Near Foundation working together. I think you got Polkadot and Cardano working together to do those things. So these are things headed in the right direction. Also, I will just say this. I was trying to move uh, Near. When I, when I send Near to people on a, just a regular wallet, it's like seconds. It, it takes no time and it's like super cheap. It's like fractions of a penny. But I tried to move near from the exchange which is coinbase onto my tangent wallet and it took almost an hour and when you're using these things and you know how we'll talk about how fast it is how the tps is very high the throughput's very very good and then people will try to move it from their exchange onto their wallet and like this is a piece of trash it doesn't really work so i just want to give like a public service announcement just so you know that it's not the chain itself that's screwing things up it's the centralized exchanges that slow things down for whatever reason that they're doing it. Like I said, usually it takes two or three seconds to move near. This one, it took damn near an hour. And I know like in, in our world, we think an hour, that's ridiculous. But just remember, this is way faster than any centralized bank out there. Well, as far as it's going to cost you an arm and a leg, 15, 20 bucks for just a wire transfer. It's going to take uh, one to two business days at minimum business days not the weekend so there is that part also uh i was moving this to, to tangent because i just found out that uh the tangent wallet now supports near it also supports caspa and a whole slew of things uh someone asked me what's the best cold storage wallet that you like that's the cheapest or the most inexpensive i should say not the cheapest and it's tangent hands down like this ah, it's not on me Right now, I don't know if you guys know this. Most of you do. But Tangem used to be, I did a deep dive video. There's a link in the description. It looks just like this. Tangem Cold Storage Wallet. And it used to be that you, that you would not generate your mnemonic phrase for your private keys. It was just kept in these three cards. And some people loved it, like me. And some people did not like it, like uh, most people. So right now, they upgraded it. And now you can write down your 12 or 24-word mnemonic phrase on a piece of paper and try to keep it safe as much as possible. And it does both. You can do that or you can put your private key within the cards. And it's pretty cheap, I think. Three cards, which is what I recommend, 62 bucks. Two card set is under 50 bucks. And that's with my promo code, Dan. Now, this link in the description, it is, it is an affiliate link. You don't have to use it. You can go right to tangent.com. And you can put in Dan. Or if you hate my guts, you don't even have to put in Dan. You can just say, you know what, F Dan, because I don't want a discount. That's fine. Don't get the 10% off. But if you want to look into Tangem, it's what I use all the time. I actually use three. I use Tangem and Ledger and Ellie Pal, even though Ledger's a pain in the A. But uh, this is what I use right now. And uh, I, I love it. And so far, all three of those I just named, none of them have been hacked. Tangem's been around since 2018. Ledger's been around before that. Ellie Pal, I think, were 2019. Correct me in the comments section. But they've never been hacked. True Ledger has been hacked for your personal data, uh, like your name and your your email and stuff like that. But that's every single website, it seems like. But not 
your private keys on Ledger. Tangem, never happened. Elipal hasn't happened. So I'm just saying, this is the cold storage wallet that I use. And once you start using it, I mean, this is what I use exclusively. I, I hate using the Ledger now. Once you start using it, you're going to understand why this will be the cold storage wallet to bring people in. If they know how to use a debit card, they'll figure this out. So there's that on as far as like, and then I was happy because uh, they put near on the uh, new upgrade for their uh, app. So I transferred all my near over. And then also on top of that, I'd like to announce that uh, the Sweatcoin app, they just implemented their decentralized exchange onto, the, onto their wallet. And you can now swap out Sweat, Near, Woo, USDC, Ethereum, and uh, wrapped Bitcoin. So if you're looking at yourself like, I can't afford, I can't afford any crypto. Well, it's okay. Download that free app, link in the description, start walking around, and then get some crypto. And that's it. That's it for today. So I shall grass. <laughs> so everybody, if you like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive, but that's it today for the news and what we want to talk about now.